Welcome to the Holy Spirit's Curriculum of Joy podcast. My name is Wanaka Oberhuber, and I'm your host. My guest today is John McIntosh. Hi. Hi. So wonderful to have you here. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. So happy you decided to join. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Let's start with a... A uh, very broad question, so that we get an idea of what we're talking about. Um, how did you get to the to see things the way you do today? Hmm. Well, we all, of course, came in already free, and we simply had forgotten. Uh, there are some that that come in that uh, remember relatively soon, but most uh, go through the life or what they call an incarnation, um, relatively unaware of who they really are or what's really going on. Uh, There are some that get onto a, what's called a spiritual path, whether it's religious or or so-called metaphysical, esoteric, whatever. Um, And there are a few that, that make um, what I call freedom, uh, their number one priority. Uh, and even then, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that uh, they will, people use the word uh, awaken. I use the, the, the word uh, awareness, become aware of who they really are. It doesn't necessarily um, make that a certainty. So in my case, um, I was uh, born into a uh, highly dysfunctional family. And uh, this, of course, is very often looked at as a tragedy, but actually it's a blessing uh, because what it does is it sets the stage for um, uh, the conditioning, which many people call karma, but that has many, many different connotations. So I never use the word. Uh, The conditioning, which is attachments, expectations, identifications tied to uh, uh, time, um, uh, which is um, the past, and imagination, um, which is the future, Uh, memory and time being the same thing. Uh, That conditioning is what uh, manifests uh, the um, false self, what many people call the ego, but once again, that has many connotations. I simply call it the false self, um, which is the body-mind identity that most refer to as me. And so I came into an environment that was um, violent um, and highly dysfunctional. And um, this set the stage for all of the conditioning uh, that was, if you like, remaining, the clouds that hide the sun that you are, to um, be upon the stage of this this particular um, play. Uh, Each one's uh, life is actually a play on a stage of illusions. And so in this particular case, I came onto a stage that had all of the conditioning available as a result of of this dysfunction. So it's really a blessing. And that's the case for everyone. They don't necessarily see it that way. And um, uh, during uh, the first 20 years of my life, I, I went through enormous trauma. Uh, and I found myself uh, drawn to um, horror movies as a way of release. I was very, very attracted to the supernatural aspect of it, which I recognized later, but didn't at the time. And then later, uh, science fiction. And and so these precursors to um, looking deeper uh, were ways of looking at... at um, life beyond the veil of of the the day-to-day norm that most people call reality. And um, then when I was 20, I was presented with a book that um, awakened the mind uh, to a very high level. Uh, It was called Think and Grow Rich. I'm sure many people on this line uh, are familiar with the book. It's the progenitor of virtually every self-empowerment uh, book that exists today by Napoleon Hill. And I recognized almost immediately that through the mind, you could manifest anything in the uh, physical world uh, that you wanted. Uh, ultimately, um, 
I followed the, the, the guidelines of it, um, which are very uh, simply summed up by saying whatever you put your attention on, uh, whatever your intention is, and you put your attention on with passion, uh, will will come into fruition if you are persistent with it. Um, people have heard this many times, but uh, they don't necessarily uh, follow it. Um, I did, and I eventually became uh, extremely wealthy. I was a multimillionaire. And uh, that was part of it. Then 10 years later, um, when I was 30, uh, June of 1976, I spent a day with uh, Nikola Tesla's uh, protege, Arthur Matthew, who um, is probably um, his unknown son. He looked exactly like him, so I'm sure it was his son. And he presented me with a book, a manuscript that Tesla had written called The Wall of Light. And that week I stepped onto what many people call the spiritual path. And uh, so that was the beginning of a conscious focus on um, the spirituality. Uh, I knew nothing about uh, uh, the fact that the, uh, the universe is a dream, uh, an illusion contained within the, the, the one self, as I call it. Uh, you could call it consciousness, you can call it the absolute, but, but uh, it's uh, totally an illusion. And as the Course in Miracles, uh, which I guess many people on this line know, uh, whatever uh, can be threatened is not real. So whatever has a beginning and ending uh, can be threatened. And so everything that exists within the, uh, the movie playing on the screen of consciousness is, is an illusion that comes and goes and is therefore not real. And um, so I didn't know anything about that at the time uh, that I began studying, but I, I dove into spirituality, metaphysics, uh, esoteric philosophies, religions, belief systems, and devoured it. Uh, because I already had this understanding of the mind, I didn't realize that the mind was an illusion. Um, I thought that the mind was a way of me becoming uh, more sophisticated in the world through spirituality, since I had then appropriated this new information. And I had no idea who Tesla was at the time, but I found out very quickly that he was uh, easily the, the greatest inventor uh, in the last many centuries. Um, and uh, so uh, I, I basically studied everything um, of, of any note. Um, and then in 1995, I think it was, um, I was, as I said, very wealthy. I was uh, uh, presiding over thousands of um, distributors uh, in the organization that I was with all over the world. And one of them uh, who had AIDS was carrying around this uh, Course in Miracles book. And I asked him what it was, and uh, we got into it, and, and I got pulled into, um, into the Course in Miracles, which I taught for 10 years. And, and then, um, I guess it was 15 or 16 years ago, um, uh, after a major demarcation in my life, um, I read a passage um, in the book. Uh, I may have passed this on to you, but I can probably find, find it. Let me just read it to you precisely in the workbook, which I, by the way, I recorded the entire uh, workbook online back in those days. So I was very passionate about everything I did. Um, workbook 189, forget this world, forget this course, and come with holy empty hands unto your God. Now, I probably had read that uh, 10 or 20 times before, but I didn't get it. That day, I got it. And I closed the book, and I haven't opened any books of any kind since um, uh, in spirituality. I basically uh, recognized that the only source of, of genuine knowledge, awareness, wisdom, call it whatever you want, um, is within. Um, and that the source of that is the true you that you are. And so, um, uh, that was a major demarcation for me, but but the stepping stone that that uh, took me into what I call freedom, um, where I am now, uh, happened uh, January fifth, nineteen ninety nine. I mentioned the day because it happened to be the last um, phase of the Mayan calendar, nine phases, something like that. I think it was a a nine month phase of billions of years, and it was the 
happened to be the first day of the last phase. For whatever uh, the value that might have had, that happened to be the day. And I was uh, rich and famous, famous in a small pond of, of the organization and the industry I was in. Uh, I had everything that the world says is success, all the trappings of life, and I could do what I wanted, go where I wanted, et cetera. All my friends were millionaires and a few billionaires. And uh, I'd even been invited to uh, uh, Trump's uh, Christmas uh, party at one point. Um, I was swinging with the with the eagles of the so-called success. And I also had all of this 23 years of spiritual information under my belt. And I was miserable. And I knew that virtually everybody uh, that I knew, which included many of the people that, that worked under me, um, were miserable. The people that were wealthy were, were miserable. They wore a, a happy mask, but I, but I knew better because I spent a lot of time with them, traveled around the world, went to the best resorts and, and spoke in front of thousands of people. And, and I could see that virtually everybody had this simmering angst on the back burner, at the very least, um, under a very thin veil. And uh, I asked the question internally, um, there must be a better way, which I think is what uh, Ellen Schuchman said uh, before uh, she started writing Course in Miracles. And uh, the floodgates opened. So I basically jumped off the cliff. And when I say jumped off the cliff, I left everything behind, my wealth, uh, the business that I was in, the, the fame, the notoriety, the marriage that I had, I left everything behind, and dove into self-discovery, as I called it then. And um, uh, I basically lost everything, and I was uh, uh, very quickly uh, united with what I call uh, my first Kalima, which is the Hindu goddess uh, that destroys the ego. And I spent uh, nine years uh, having the arrogance that was an aspect of having acquired all this so-called worldly success uh, brought to my knees and um, and then uh, broke and walking down the highway at three o'clock in the morning, literally in, in the pitch black. I was living in Florida at the time um, with five dollars in my pocket. I uh, headed towards my aging parents, which was the last place that I wanted to be, but of course the best place to be because they were still conditioning to face there. Um, and spent, uh, I think it was nine months with them and and then was united with another Kali Ma. One, the first one was like, you know, having a blowtorch uh, blown at me every day. And the second one was like living on the sun. And uh, she was in Norway and I spent seven years with her. And during that phase, about 2013, I crossed the bridge into freedom. Um, and then it took several years thereafter to handle what I call the, the whispers of conditioning that, that still came up. And there's still a few. But basically, I'm, I'm free. I'm in the world, but not of the world, as people can say very quickly and very glibly. But uh, to actually uh, be free of the illusion of the world is extremely unique. And this is not aggrandizing me because there is no such thing as me. There, of myself, I am nothing. Um, I, I have the passport and a license, but uh, there is no John McIntosh any longer. Um, and I'm here for whatever reason. Um, basically, I'm shown that moment to moment. So uh, that's the short version of um, of what happened. Uh, to, to bring me to the freedom that all of us are, the awareness of, of the what I call the one self, which is what I live as, um, you could say 24 seven, but even that's an illusion. I live that way always. Wow, what a story. <laughs> and that's all yes. it is too, just a story. <laughs> yes, a story. And I'm full of steps on the way. Yeah, it seems that way. Yes. But but uh, if you use the word steps, that that ties nicely in with the idea of following a path. Uh, but anyone that follows a path and, and uh, this is be very disillusioning to many who think that's a good thing, um, it immediately confirms the fact that you're not free now uh, because it says I'm here and my freedom is there, which is not true. And so following a path 
always keeps you following a path. It's a dog chasing its tail. The focus on the truth, uh, I, I could have woken up when I was 20, uh, but I didn't know. Um, the I still would have needed to dissolve the conditioning, but you know when you're when you're focused on your conditioning from the perspective of the awareness that you are freedom. You don't have freedom. Freedom, if you had it, is something that could be taken away from it. You are freedom. It's another word for love. It's another word for the oneself, or for abundance, or for beauty, or for joy, um, or for or for freedom, or for peace. All of these things mean exactly the same thing. Or the absolute. You are this, you don't have it, you don't acquire it, you don't earn it, you don't grow towards it, you don't get better, uh, you certainly don't self-improve and then become something, you are it now. So the idea of being on a path keeps you uh, in bondage. And that's not, uh, uh, that's, that's not accepted very easily, uh, but it's, it's a fact. And maybe we could call it, you know, op openings or realizations into the remembering of who you are. The the best thing to do always is to say as little as possible. Silence is where the power is. The less that you say about anything, the less defining or the attempt to to circumscribe infinity, um, the better. Uh, so all definitions of uh, focus on separation you see because if you can define something you limit it and the truth is that the self is abundant ab abundance and that means there's there's uh, no barriers it's uh, limitless it, uh, it's it, it, it's it's without boundaries so this is why you hear all um, the so-called free ones of the past, so-called past, uh, speak about silence as being the great power. But nevertheless, I mean, we're talking, you know, we're on this call and invariably, you know, books are written, blogs are written, articles are written, uh, words are spoken, and uh, they use as close as possible um, ways of explaining what can't be explained. The best thing um always and and the real so-called teachers are not teachers they'll never tell you that they're a teacher or a guru or anything of that sort um are those that point to who you are not if they say i can tell you what the truth is you you know for sure they can't um the truth can only be experienced it can't be explained because once again you're trying to put a frame around infinity so pointing to who you are not is the closest that someone who is free can can actually quote unquote do. We have our first question you are allowed to ask now. Okay, you don't wanna ask Justin? You put your hand up before. Okay, then I'll continue. <laughs> yeah, that sounds a lot like what a, a Course in Miracles is speaking about removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. It's not exactly. explaining love's presence, it's removing the blocks. So it's pointing exactly yeah. to those blocks, like you yeah. said. It's just, it's just. It's just clouds, which are really not there, that we think are there, we believe are there, uh, hiding the sun, which is the one self. Metaphorically, uh, it's not really much of a metaphor. It's actually the truth. Anyone want to ask a question and raise your hand and I'll let you unmute yourself. Okay, and we'll continue. <laughs> so after having found your freedom, what, how, how do you see the world now? How, how is your life? What is it like? Because you were, you said you were very, very rich. You were well known and you had a lot of contact. 
it and you had everything the world would say is what you need to be happy, right? And then you, mm -hmm. it turned out you were not happy. And then you found happiness in, in when you found freedom, right? Um, I don't call it happiness. I call it joy. Joy is who you are. Happiness is, is the um, part of the roller coaster uh, with um, sorrow. Happiness, sorrow, happiness, sorrow. Um, and uh, happiness is something that you can find uh, through thousands of different ways and means that uh, the world will point you towards, not the least of which is being, you know, rich and famous. Um, uh, these are supposed to make you happy. They don't. Um, and uh, those that say that they're happy when they have it all, so-called, um, are at the very least lying to themselves. Uh, because there's always this simmering angst, as I call it, on the back burner. You can be lying on the beach in the most beautiful, pristine, uh, paradisical place that you can find on the planet, and your mind's going a mile a minute over, what about this, what about that? I need to make this call. Uh, I wonder if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Thousands of thoughts uh, about um, uh, related to fear. Um, fear of losing something, fear of not getting something. These things are always going on. This is not happiness. And uh, once a person starts to be um, honest with themselves or what I call transparent or, or authentic, truly authentic, uh, ruthlessly authentic, um, they, they can see there, there's something's wrong with this picture. And, and if it's sufficiently wrong, uh, at least 51% um, leaning towards um, uh, frustration and 49% afraid of making a change, uh, then there's a chance that you will, quote unquote, do something about it. You're not really the doer, but it seems that way. And so um, uh, the concept of happiness is an illusion. Joy is who you really are, and it's a flat line. And in the, met, in the midst of pain, um, there is always joy. Uh, the concept of suffering uh, is directly associated with um, uh, sorrow. And uh, suffering is directly associated with the belief in victims. And victims is directly associated with the belief in separation, which, of course, is the original fall of the consciousness of of um, the oneself into the illusion of separation, uh, where the possibility of the universe uh, comes into being, because you you can't have a universe of of things and experiences unless you have a from here to there, which involves time and space. So there must be this this uh, notion that separation is real; otherwise, the universe couldn't exist. So it's not a mistake. It was how the, the one self um, created a movie screen uh, on which it could play aspects of itself so that it could know itself. And that involved the entire swing of the pendulum from the deepest, darkest um, to the brightest, lightest, um, experiencing everything. None of it's a mistake. And you just simply get to a point where you've had enough and and then what i call the divine discontent the thorn in the side which is the frustration with what is uh kicks in and and pulls you out of the bondage otherwise you you as the self would be trapped forever and uh and this is why suffering is a blessing um it's what brings people to their knees and then eventually their belly and um and then to what I call the no matter what, in capital letters, choice to be free. And, uh, and that's when you make um, freedom uh, your number one priority. It has to be more important than, than air in order for it to come about. You have to really be frustrated. And this is why suffering is, is, is such an enormous blessing. Most of the world looks at it as a curse, which it isn't. Wow. Yeah. Suffering as a blessing. Amazing. I haven't heard that yeah. one too often. <laughs> um, so, so you're saying this 
this frustration, this suffering becomes so strong that one was willing to make a shift? Yes, it's what I call the, the 51, 49% attitude. Um, your fear of, of uh, to put it correctly, dying, not dying physically, but the death of the identity, the false self, the body-mind um, identity, uh, the fear of being nothing has to be less than the frustration of being in the bondage of the illusion. And so call it frustration, call it suffering, uh, whatever label you want to put on it, it has to be greater than your fear of being nothing, of dying. Wow. <laughs> so you say once that shift occurs, you come to this place of being in a consistent joy, right? Not happiness, <laughs> joy. You become aware of, of many facets of the diamond of the one self. There is only one self, but the light shines through all these different windows or facets from within out and makes it look like it's, it's uh, many. Um, and uh, joy is one of those facets. Um, let's go into what 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 is a typical day for you like? If there was a typical day, I wouldn't be free. Um, okay. <laughs> because because uh, obviously that would involve routine. Now, do I have routines? Absolutely. Um, but can they be broken? Every one of them. Uh, can they be broken? No matter how critically important they seem to be, and of course talk to virtually anyone there's going to be a few things that are um, absolutely necessary in their life no there's nothing like that at all um, you do certain things obviously you know you 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 eat you take care of the body um, you sleep uh, you do some basic things but what if uh, what if you don't eat for a few days and i don't mean because you're fasting but uh, because you don't have any food uh, what if uh, you don't sleep for a few days um, because uh, there are certain demands being placed upon what most people call, um, you know, the body mind. Uh, it's really just the, the, the self in disguise. Uh, then you don't. And uh, and you're open to it. It isn't, uh, you know, that you hear this, this voice in the wilderness saying, okay, you're not going to sleep for the next two days or, or you're not going to um, uh, eat for the next couple of days or you're not going to do this or that that you normally do. It, it just happens. So the, the moment to moment, what many people call the now, the moment to moment living or experiencing um, is always spontaneous. It might seem like, gee, I did this a thousand times before and I did it basically the same. And, and that may be true. Uh, but uh, if you are called upon, and when I say you, I'm always talking about the self. The self is talking to itself. Um, to to go left instead of right on a particular day at a particular hour for whatever reason uh, that may not become obvious, um, then that's what you do. There isn't any question about it at all. There's no thought. Well, should I do this? Do I need to? I need to consider this. Is what the mind will say. They're presented with some new idea and they'll say, "Well, I need to think about this." No, you don't think about anything. It just comes. You just know because you have surrendered. And when you've surrendered, uh, the enormous weight involved in making choices is gone. Uh, that doesn't make you weak. It makes you strong. Vulnerability is power. Um, uh, control is weakness. Uh, but of course, the world is upside down. So they think just the opposite. So there is no consistency other than what seems to be uh, a routine that you might normally have. Um, and you know, like we had an appointment today and I, I got you know, onto the appointment maybe 30 seconds or, or a minute before I was supposed to. Um, so that seems like a plan, but even that could have changed literally the second that it was supposed to happen. And, uh, without any, uh, uh compunction, whatever, I would simply have followed whatever that change was.
because I'm not tied to anything. You see, there's no attachments, there's no expectations and no identification with the world. This call is part of the world. This call is not even happening, it's a dream. So we have a question, go ahead. Unmute and then ask your question. You mean me? Yes. Yes, hello. Uh, Hi. This is John, and thank you, Wanako, and uh, lovely to hear your conversation. I was curious about, uh, you said that joy is one of these facets that you're experiencing through. What are the others? Thank you. Yeah. I, 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 can you repeat that, Wanako? I, I, I didn't really hear it. She wants yeah. to know more about the facet of joy that you were speaking about. You said okay. that joy, joy was one of the facets. And yes. what are the others? Thank you. Uh, well, there's innumerable. Uh, beauty, for example, is another. Uh, when you look at a sunset and you are perhaps overwhelmed, um, you are looking at an aspect of a manifestation of you. You're not looking at something that is outside. You're looking at you. Beauty is an aspect of the oneself. It is who you are. Uh, love, uh, which people throw around quite casually, um, uh, is an aspect of a name for, if you like, um, the oneself. Now, this is not the love that the world calls love because um, conditioning, attachments, expectations, and identifications tied to memory and imagination, past and future, are what make up the illusion of a body-mind identity, a me, a person, and without which it wouldn't exist. So uh, the conditioning is always there as a filter when love is extended, as the Course puts it, um, rather than projected, uh, extended from uh, one to, let's say, another person or to a circumstance, to something that's going on in the world, for example. Um, and um, that filter taints or dilutes and, and, and usually extremely so, uh, the love that is being extended from one to another. It colors it. So unconditional love is unknown uh, to most of humanity, um, <clears throat> both in, in presenting and in experiencing it. Um, true love, real love, uh, the love that you are, has no conditions of any kind whatever. The most monstrous uh, person you can think of, uh, which is not very difficult right now because the uh, what you might call the deep state, um, the dysfunctional masculine that's that's uh, fading from this this era, um, is being exposed, and lots and lots of faces are being put to the what many people call evil. Well, <laughs> those faces behind which it's also the self. And what we're looking at then is conditional uh, love in the form of what people call hatred or revenge or retribution. Uh, these has, things have nothing whatever to do with love or reality. Um, love recognizes that the self is disguised um, in uh, that person or those people uh, or that group. Um, and is playing a part, a part of the swinging pendulum from what I call 1 to 59 on the clock, and, and that this also is the self, um, heavily uh, cloaked in costumes that make it look like it's something else. But there is nothing but the one self, so it all must be taking place within the, the grand play, what I call the grand dream of the universe, which is also an illusion. The universe is within you. It's not something that you're within, <clears throat> but it looks the opposite. So love, love and beauty are two other facets of the diamond. Um, uh, peace is another. Um, the peace that that um, is possible uh, within 
the a grand dream, uh, let's say uh, that is arriving now, or what the the Course of Miracles calls the happy dream, um, the closest that you can come to it is balance. Uh, <clears throat> and that balance is between the divine masculine and divine feminine. Well, there is no such thing as masculine and feminine in truth, but within the manifestation of the universe, of the illusion, in order to have uh, have it, you again must have separation. So separation brings about this 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 idea, this illusion of masculine and feminine. And when they are relatively balanced, you have what appears to be peace. Uh, but because the universe is based on separation, uh, there is still going to be uh, conflict and confusion and chaos to a very limited extent. And that's what we're moving into for the next couple of thousand years of the grand dream. None of it's real, none of it's actually happening, uh, but it is being experienced by the oneself, mostly as if it's outside of you. Uh, because when you're not free, you think that, you know, this is me and that's that's you, that's the world, that's the universe, and I'm experiencing it. No, you, you are experiencing it, but it's within you. And <clears throat> so uh, real peace is not known, not possible to be known, while you live in the world and of the world. Freedom is another uh, facet of um, the diamond of truth, you might call it, the diamond of the oneself. And, and genuine freedom means there is no possibility of bondage. For example, it's not possible to offend uh, the oneself because there is no conditioning that sticks to it. It's also not possible for the oneself to offend uh, any one, let's say, speaking of a person, because it's never speaking to the false identity, the false self. It's always speaking to the slum, what I call the slumbering God self, itself that's slumbering. It's always speaking to it, which can't be offended. So it's not possible to be in bondage to the idea of rudeness, for example, one of millions of possibilities. Um, a, 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 a oneself um, uh, that is aware of itself can be in a uh, prison um, uh, in the dream, and yet they are free because only the body and the mind uh, and the identity is imprisoned, but the reality is not. It's not possible to bind um, uh, the, uh, the oneself in any way. So those are those are aspects of grace is another um, aspect, which is love and action um, of the oneself that you are. Um, might as well ask your follow up question. Yeah, thank you. Um, Maybe I got the answer. Why? Why does we? Why does? Why do we have to have these filters? Is it that there has to be this polarity for us to experience that to really exist, uh, or or that the universe somehow exists? Yeah, uh, uh, can you just uh, repeat that to me? Why? Why? What? She's speaking about clarity and the question of why the universe exists. No, polarity. Oh, why, and polarity. Why, yeah, why is, why do we have this, not you anymore, but why do we have these filters of separation? Is there, is it because we have the need, there is a need, there has to be this polarity uh, opposite polarities in the universe. Is that is that is why we have it. Why well, let let me it? let me say that. Uh, thank you. Let me say that uh, I most certainly still experience polarity, but it doesn't control me. That's the difference. I experience everything. I am the one self experiencing itself, but I'm not controlled. That's what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. Um, the, the universe cannot exist without separation. Separation is just another word for polarity. You can call it male or female, 
um, black or white, up or down, whatever you want to call it, polarity. Uh, without separation, there is no from here to there. Um, uh, presumably, uh, each one uh, on the line right now is, is somewhere other than where I am, but that's not true. Um, the illusion of separation from the chair that I'm sitting in to the, the chair or, or seat or whatever that you might be sitting in um, is there because of the dream of separation the idea that uh there is a masculine and a feminine or a polarity is absolutely necessary to have a from here to their equation uh you cannot have manifestation without it so it's a it's essential you could call it a building block a fundamental building block of the manifestation of the illusion of the universe. Um, the oneself is the blank screen. The movie playing on the blank screen requires the illusion that what's playing on the blank screen is actually happening. And that can't happen unless you have this idea of separation. Now, I don't have the bondage of separation because i know it's not true but i have the experience of it uh, because i am free within the illusion so i'm able to look at and experience everything as the, the illusion that it is but as a projection of an aspect of the self of the oneself i can experience myself without the agony that the um unawareness of um the oneself uh, brings about but the oneself wants to experience the agony as well as the ecstasy wants the whole range from from one to 59 wants to experience itself its natural state is nothing or emptiness well you can't experience it cannot experience itself yourself unless there is contrast. So you can't savor and taste contrast, sweet and sour, uh, for example, uh, unless there is polarity. So it's a blessing. So Mark, do you wanna ask something now? We don't understand you, Mark. Hardly. Just barely. Do you do you have can you go closer to your loudspeaker or some uh, to your speaker or something? To your microphone? Yeah, it's still not working. Sorry. So you can follow up on your questions. <laughs> Do you mean me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, so I know somehow how you, so how, do you get the desire that you want something, or are you just a receiver? But are you just a receiver? But somehow, aren't we somehow sending out some desire, something unthirsty, and then whatever it is? Do you have what in the moment? How how do you choose? Yeah, of course I know there is because I'm living it to like I'm surrendering to and there's a part of itself that I'm not uh, participating in but even though I am in it and to trust that is somehow yeah it's somehow following it and let the light come but I have another question about relationships 
how do you feel the same thing of something extra uh, like you did before of a person in of the opposite, uh, yeah, like a partner? What is speaking to you? Is it different now or when it was before? Is, or is that the same as the energy feels in your body and all that? Thank you. Um, it, it sounds like you're asking about desire. Um, do I have uh, desires like uh, the mind does? Uh, no, I don't. Um, am I pulled in a certain direction? Um, always, uh, constantly. And, I, and that's the actual uh, phraseology that I use is I'm pulled to do this, I'm pulled to do that. Um, but speaking directly about partners, for example, um, I have a partner uh, who I am not living with currently, uh, but probably will be soon uh, when this uh, situation in the world is um, uh, terminated. Uh, that will also be soon. Um, and I met her on her 65th birthday, which happened to be the fall spring um equinox and um she had been free for some 22 years or something like that when i when i met her she's in australia i'm in toronto and so we're diagonally exactly half way around the world and there was an awareness uh that uh, some kind of a what i call unicity which is not a relationship relationship is always about separation no matter how so-called beautiful it might appear, um, and, and very often isn't because relationships are an excellent place to experience the mirror of who you are not, to be triggered by who you are not so that you can deal with the conditioning, um, which we should probably talk about. Um, but there was a pull um, to respond. Now, the way that we met is that she was having a coffee uh, on her birthday in um, this little town called Bellingen, which is like a Camelot in Australia, little village, uh, sitting with a friend who was tuned in, it wasn't free, but it was tuned in, and had asked if she had heard of me. And she said no. And he said, oh, well, you should, uh, you should read his writings. And so she, this is uh, almost four years ago now, just uh, two months from now, it'll be four years. And she um, uh, received from him, I guess uh, almost immediately, um, some information to connect with me. She read something that uh, I had written or a few things and wrote me, which she was not inclined to do with anybody. She'd lived a very solitary life for many years. And um, I could feel. Uh, when I saw her name and I saw what she wrote, which was not much, I could feel uh, something was happening, a pull, as I like to call it. And uh, so I responded and um, we immediately began communicating, which we've done virtually every day since. And um, so we knew that there was some kind of a connection. Now, just as a sidebar, on this planet, since the fall of consciousness, um, uh, from the awareness of, of oneness of the oneself to the lack of awareness or, or the idea of belief in separation, there have always been what many people will call sages or masters or gurus, whatever you want to call it, just people that are aware of who they are. Uh, and mostly very clandestine, very cloistered, completely unknown, not in any history book, um, that have what you might call held the balance. Some people call it holding the light, but holding the balance on the planet. Uh, because uh, when the pendulum swings, it can't go beyond one to 59. If it hits zero, the planet is gone. And so um, she and I are like that. We're like um, holding a certain balance uh, for what was coming, uh, which is what's been happening the last two years. And, and for what 
is about to come, which is, uh, you know, we're very swiftly moving into this um, 2000 year phase of what I call the era of peace and, and light, um, uh, peace, light and love, if you like. And and we are like um, light standards, pylons, um, holding uh, the balance. Now, is there a love between us? Well, there is no between, we're one. Everything that I do always involves her. Um, there, there, there is none of this um, uh, romantic um, uh, love relationship uh, yearning and longing that so many people have, which is basically a yearning and a longing for completion uh, because when you are, believe in separation, you feel incomplete. Um, that doesn't mean to say that it's not possible, uh, which may sound like a contradiction, but it's not something that controls you. Always remember that living in the world but not of the world means that you can savor and taste everything that's in the dream, but none of it can control you. In fact, your savoring of the dream is far more intense than when you are dreaming and believing that the dream is real so it doesn't mean that you don't have or share the same things that uh, the sleeping masses uh, experience you just don't have all the conditioning in between the course says uh, Je uh, jesus said uh, i don't have anything that you don't have i just don't have anything extra what he meant was conditioning um so there's nothing in the way to taint or dilute um or color uh, the the purity of every experience. Uh, so desire is not necessary because you never feel incomplete, and yet you can be pulled because that's the next spontaneous thing or experience um, that's going to occur. So it it can appear to be the same, but the experience of the the dream is far more. Um, let's say sublime and consistent. It's not broken. It's not up and down. It's not a little bit this and a little bit that, and then more of this, and more of that. No, it's consistently. Um, even the word ecstatic uh, is an understatement. Um, it's softer than that, uh, much softer. Uh, and of course, once again, it's not possible to explain because you can't place a frame around infinity. So, oh, Mark, you can ask your question. If it doesn't work audio, you can write me your questions and comments, and I can read them out. Thanks, Vinaka. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thanks. I've, I've slipped onto my phone. I seem to have picked up. Hello, John. John, I just wonder if we can Hi. talk. Hi, Mark. Hi. Uh, talk to free will, uh, the concept of free will. My understanding is that the 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 idea or concept of free will is an illusion and that would then say to me that the idea of surrender um, is, is, is kind of letting go for what is, is going to happen anyway and takes the ego out of the picture um, the ego likes to think it's in control but it's but it's not in fact um, so 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 my, yeah, so the question is is uh, does free will exist at all? And if not, um, uh, the idea of surrender then is just letting letting go to what is going to happen or what will take place anyway. Does that kind of make mm. sense? S start with the fact that everything that's happening is a dream. Everything. Yes. And so whatever words we, we put on anything are dream words about dream situations. Um, and of course, there are dreams within dreams within dreams. It's a it's a cycle, not a circle, but a cycle uh, that goes deeper and deeper and deeper into this illusion that you know the the universe is real, the world is real, my life is real, all the stuff that I have and that I'm doing and I've acquired is real. Uh, you know, these are the the depths of of the illusion. So within the dream of the world of um, a body mind uh, identity. Uh, on planet Earth, free will is absolutely a real, but it's a dream. Um, the idea that surrender is possible within the dream is also a dream. 
none of these things are possible because you've never not you meaning anyone which is always the one self you've never not been free but as long as you believe you meaning anyone believe that you are this or that uh, then there are going to be parameters tied to it called beliefs and most of those beliefs are fairly consistent uh, throughout humanity uh, obviously we have disagreements on on this or that but but certain things like this idea of free will and surrender uh, are pretty commonly either believed in or completely not believed in um, one or the other so neither is real nevertheless um in the course i'm sure many times said you use the dream to to dream yourself out of the dream uh in whatever way it explained uh, so the use of surrender um who's who is surrendering is it the false self this false self doesn't exist how can it surrender but it believes that it exists so if it is surrendering then what's it surrendering to uh it's surrendering it's belief that it has a free will or if you like the idea of control um, to a higher power that it believes is separate from itself all of these things are enormous uh, depths of, of separation um, so that that higher power can either take it over overshadow it or it can somehow grow towards or, or become um, that higher power or or be one with it, be the son of God, or whatever label the belief system happens to be, uh, it, it, life gets better, hopefully, uh, when you surrender. And it depends on it, at what level your understanding of surrender is. If it comes with a with a religious belief, then there's all kinds of of um, hooks and hangups and and costumes and ceremonies and things that that go along with it. Um, if, if, it, if it's spirituality, there's very often many associated with spirituality as well. Um, uh, but ultimately, uh, what happens is you realize, just like with suffering, that you suffer until you realize that suffering is not necessary. But it's necessary to have suffering in order to get that recognition. Um, and, and so, therefore, you could say, well, then it was necessary. Yes, you could say that. And um, the same is true with um, uh, the idea of free will. The idea of free will, for example, is extremely important when a person believes that they are a separate entity and that they have the power to change things. Like when I read Think and Grow Rich when I was 20, I thought, I believed that I could change the world, change my world specifically to be better somehow, whatever that meant, um through the power of thought intention attention and passion and and it happened and so that reinforced the belief until much later i recognized uh that uh, all of that was happening within a dream i was dreaming that i was making my experience better which of course it ended up not being better it just i had everything but i was miserable so uh these things are necessary to bring you to another stage and even saying that sounds like oh there must be levels if there's levels there must be a path that also is a dream so you need to have the illusion of a path the illusion of levels the illusion of 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 dimensions all of these things are stepping stones of thought to unwind yourself from the descent into uh the belief that the world is real and that you're real uh, and that there's a higher power outside of yourself um, and and return to the simplicity that nothing's happening there's just the one self so it seems like that but these are all dreams within dreams within dreams that dream you into the descent and dream you out of the descent none of them are real now, but if it works for you if it feels right this is the important thing this is always the criteria upon which uh, you could say choices are made until you no longer uh, even think about the concept of making your own choices, um, is what fills your heart? What makes you feel joyful? Then that is the next moment. Uh, you've, you've heard this, uh, I think Joseph Campbell was talking, follow your joy, follow your bliss. 
Uh, this is absolutely true. And then everything else follows. And this is absolutely true. When you follow your joy, of course, you're going mostly against the grain of the of the illusion of the dream. Um, but the joy factor begins to kick in. In reality, you're becoming aware of who you really are. You don't know it at that point, but you feel it. And it feels good, even though the following your joy might mean, uh, let's say that you were born into a family of doctors. They want you to be a doctor and you want to be an artist. And they think that you're stupid and, you know, you're cast out of the family or you're, or you're ostracized or you're treated as less than. And you do it anyway and you feel a sense of joy as a result of being an artist. Good or bad, doesn't matter how good an artist or bad an artist that you are, according to belief systems of good and bad. The, the point is you are following your joy. You could say following your heart. And, and that is as close as you can get to the awareness of truth until you are always uh, in an unbroken stream in the awareness of the one self that you are. Uh, it's a very, very rapid uh, track uh, home. But still, uh, and we should probably, before this is over, talk about the conditioning and the desolation of conditioning, uh, which is what brings you to freedom. But that's, hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Looks like Mark wasn't able to say anything more. Um, yeah, you can speak the other person I allowed to unmute. Yes. Um, I have a question about image and imagination. We have that. Uh, faculty and um, today I heard about uh, that we need to somehow have an image ourselves to move forward to something if we have if we want this connection with the universe of source energy because if we don't move ourselves or imagine nothing happens and we are put on hold uh, so I just want to hear your point of view about image, self-image, and of course imagination. Thank you. Uh, what's the word? Image. Yes, and imagination. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, the self has no point of view, has no opinions because opinions change, and whatever changes um, uh, is not real. You know, whatever has a beginning and an ending, whatever uh, can be this today and that tomorrow um, is an illusion. So the, the self is empty and it has no opinions, no take on something, no, no point of view on anything. It's empty and, and when it needs to, it just simply knows. Um, the concept of imagination is about the future. Memory is about the past. Uh, both are illusions. Um, uh, without the use of the imagination, it seems like nothing will happen. Well, that's another word for silence. And when there is silence, whatever is supposed to so-called happen, if you're in a physical body, if the one self is in a physical body, um, and the mind is the servant to the heart, as I put it, which is the servant to, to the, the truth, servant to the, to the one self, uh, then whatever is supposed to happen um, will show up. Now, in reality, everything shows up the way it's supposed to show up anyway, because everything is predestined. Every single breath is predestined. There isn't anything that happens because you think it into being. That's an illusion as well. You're dreaming, believing, you meaning anyone, dreaming that you're making things happening, that you had this great inspiration, this great epiphany that said i should go and do this uh, you know to save the world save people to um uh, do this or do that um, uh, if the urge was there what i call a pull that's part of your destiny uh but you're not actually doing anything uh whatever is going to unfold will unfold in a predestined way because of the previous conditioning that you you 
meaning everyone, came into a another illusionary dream body mind uh, and identity again, so-called incarnations, which is a dream as well. Uh, everything was predestined according to previous conditioning. Um, so the imagination is an instrument of the dreamer, the body mind identity, the same as memory is an instrument of it to perpetuate the dream. Uh, and it's absolutely not necessary at all. Memory and and imagination are not necessary at all. They're they're heavily promoted. Um, uh, you know, the movie industry is huge on that. The self empowerment industry is huge on imagination, and the movie uh, industry romanticizes uh, memory. Uh, neither one of these is necessary in order for uh, the the dream to unfold or for for one to shift from uh, sleeping to the full awareness of the oneself. But um, the question hasn't been asked, so I'll I'll bring it up because it's it's the most important thing, and that that is to do with uh, conditioning. As I said before, conditioning, which is what most people call karma, uh, but I don't because there's so many different meanings associated with it than that complicated. But it's very very simple. It's attachments and we know what attachments are you know this is mine and i and i i love it you know this is my dog this is my car this is my house um expectations you know i i hope to meet the perfect mate and have a family and i'd like to live in this country and i'd like to do this or that expectations and then identifications is like well you know i've gone to university and i've got a degree in this or that and so this is who i am and i'm also very good at this sport and and um um uh, and let's say that the uh, the body is very important to a person, and so uh, you identify with this body, and the list is endless. So attachments, expectations, and identifications tied to the illusion of memory, which is the past, and the illusion of imagination, which is the future, um, make up the illusion, the dream of a body-mind identity that most people call me. And none of it is real, uh, but it is certainly believed to be real. And people have their driver's license and they have their passports and they have uh, their addresses and uh, uh, they have a myriad of things that validate the fact there are certificates on the wall of achievement, etc. The sports team that they are tied to that's, you know, life itself to some people. Um, uh, this is the way that one validates that this is who they are. And of course, it's constantly changing, literally from moment to moment, but certainly from year to year, uh, it's changing. You know, who you were at seven is not who you are at 70. You're not either of those things, either of those people, but it appears that, that you are. So that conditioning is the bondage or the chains that, that are the clouds that hide the sun. And the what I call the wayless way, the pathless path to freedom is the desolation of conditioning, the removal of, or I like to call it the dissolving of conditioning removes the clouds that hide the sun. You are the sun, but you don't see that. You don't become the sun. You don't earn the sun. You don't get better and improve so that you qualify for the sun because this you doesn't exist. It has to die. This is called dying before you die, the death of the identity. I of myself am nothing is what our uh, beautiful brother said. And that's the truth. So one must disappear in order for the truth to appear. And the way that that happens is the desolation of conditioning and, and, and the direct route, which every single concept, every practice, every discipline, every belief system eventually dovetails into uh, is self-inquiry or self-inquiry slash surrender. And self-inquiry, which was touted um, heavily uh, in the last century through uh, Ramana, but it's been touted by uh, masters and gurus and saints and sages uh, through different names and far more complicated uh, for thousands of years. 
uh, but uh, in the last century through Ramana, uh, which simply is, who am I? And it works like this. And I can tell you that if you follow this unequivocally, if you follow this and it becomes your priority, more important than air, that you will in this lifetime, absolutely for certain, um, return to the awareness of who you are. Um, I use surrender. I didn't even know about self-inquiry. I use surrender. I didn't even know that I was using surrender until I was well into it. Uh, that's the flip side of self-inquiry, but the two work together. And it works like this. Let's say that you are triggered by something, a mirror in the world, because the entire world is a precise mirror of your conditioning. It shows up, the world shows up precisely according to who you believe you are. So let's say that you are cut off uh, in an intersection by uh, a driver and your reaction to it, your, the trigger that you receive when you're cut off will show you an aspect of conditioning which is ready to be dissolved. Now, initially, the reaction could be about the story. The story was you were cut off. Um, the story was you became enraged. Uh, the story was maybe you swore at the person, even though they're now half a mile down the road. Uh, the story could continue into getting together with uh, uh, your, your, your spouse or, or, or mate um, and telling the story and maybe even getting drunk about it or taking drugs or doing whatever it was that you are because you're so infuriated about it. You're triggered. It might be a minor trigger, but it could be a major trigger. And the trigger is the story. But beneath the story, underneath the story, is the essence, which is intangible, related to um, four specific things, guilt, shame, remorse, and unworthiness. Those four things are the foundations of conditioning. So unworthiness is the primary one. And unworthiness came about as a result of our separation, the belief in the separation, so-called Garden Eden story, the belief in separation of being thrown out of the Garden of Eden. It's just a story. But it's the idea that you did something wrong and God threw you out. And then you hated God for it and you became guilty for that hate. So you felt unworthy. The underlying essence of the fall of consciousness from the awareness of the one self that you are into the idea of separation created this initial conditioning called unworthiness. I'm not good enough. I'm unworthy. I don't deserve. I'm invisible was the big one for me when I was a child. No one sees me. No one hears me. So when you're cut off in the intersection, it's as if I'm not worthy of respect I'm unworthy. That's the underlying conditioning. And it's it's like a pastry. There are many, many, many layers to that conditioning. So here's how you do um, self-inquiry. And it is so simple that the mind will immediately dismiss it for most people who've never heard of it because simplicity is the antithesis of what the false self believes is necessary, no pain, no gain, in order to achieve anything. And of course, it wants always to seek and never find, as the Course says, because to find means that it has to dissolve. So the conditioning is removed this way. You say, who is it that is disturbed by this, and then you fill in the blank, whatever the trigger was. Who is it that is disturbed by this or enraged or upset by who is it that is disturbed by this trigger what and you fill in the blank of which there will be thousands many thousands and the answer is always and never embellished me never say more than that me and then the next question is who am i not changed in any way who am i so who is it that's upset by this XYZ trigger? Me, who am I? Now, I suggest and add to this the flip side, the surrender, which is thy will be done. Now, the idea here is not to ask some uh, invisible power or outside source or God 
uh, who am I so that you can get a description of who you are. That's not what this is about. What it's about is shining a light on the false self, which is hidden in plain sight, has been hiding in plain sight forever. And what happens to the false self when it's exposed to the light of truth by asking, who is it that is upset by this trigger, me, who am I, is that it withdraws an aspect of that conditioning back into the self and dissolves. It's as simple as that. And if one uses this, and eventually every single practice in whatever incarnated dream life it occurs, every single practice eventually dovetails into um, who am I, into self-inquiry. Um, it is the direct and only route. Now, people say, well, I practice meditation and I'm frequently in samadhi and I, I have all these wonderful experiences. Well, you could be in samadhi for two years. When you come out of it, you still have conditioning to deal with. It doesn't matter what you do if you come back into the conditioning that you went into that doing with, uh, then you're still in bondage. So the removal of, the, the, the disposal of, the desolation of or dissolving of conditioning is the only way that one comes to the freedom that they are. And if someone has a spontaneous awakening like Ramana did, or like uh, Jesus did when he was baptized, um, uh, by John the Baptist, who was his master in a previous life, um, then uh, it's because they've done the, the work, um, so-called work, uh, of desolation of the false self uh, previously, in a previous dream. So that is the direct lightning fast route home to the, the full an unbroken, seamless awareness of the oneself. And um, uh, we were talking to Mark Edwards on the on the line here before, who I know is involved in this intensely right now. And I, I can't remember what he calls it, a brain fry or something like that. Some sort of a um, uh, an incredible experience. I didn't go through that. I went through surrender, uh, which is the other side of it. Um, but the two together are are lightning fast. Very, very difficult but extremely simple uh, because the false self does not want to ask these questions. It doesn't want you asking, who am I? It doesn't want you asking who is it that's upset uh, because it knows that its, its days are numbered, so-called days, dream days are numbered uh, if it does that. This is the only thing that I ever talk about. The only reason that I, I write books and that I post blogs uh, Etc. is to is to explain what I just said in a thousand different ways until uh, somebody gets it. Um, and if they do, they do. If they don't, they don't. Uh, eventually, everyone will. Elena, you have a question. No? Okay. Thank you for your explanation, John. I, th I think uh, Miss 65 uh, um, uh, heard questions. Uh, somebody was Miss 65 was raised. Yeah, but she's she's not here anymore. She just left. <laughs> oh. Now oh, she's okay. back. There uh, we ah, go. No, she's here. Okay. Mm -hmm. There you go, Miss 65. Yes, uh, I have hearing that. So I, um, they were interrupting me. Um, I want to thank you, John. Um, you got, yeah. I actually. You took that example because I needed to hear that. Um, I'm all that is my trigger too, and it's it. Bottom line is somehow the unworthiness. Um, you know, me or my children is uh, treating badly, then I get triggered, and I somehow want to involve the whole world. Um, 
So I have to, I want to uh, somehow uh, turn inwards instead and not fight the world. So I just want to thank you for that. And You're thank welcome. you for this lovely interview. Thank You're you. Welcome. Let, <laughs> let me just speak about uh, the triggering uh, when you talk about children. If if I was um, uh, in any given situation uh, where I was in the vicinity of, let's say, a child being um, misused, now that doesn't mean that you know the parent is disciplining a child, you know, so they don't run out in the intersection or something like that. But but uh, there's some kind of abuse is going on. If I was there, then I was, I'm was. i supposed to be there because I'm never where I'm not supposed to be. And it's possible, of course, I, I, I would never say I would do this or I would do that because that's planning. And, and that's based on, on a history of beliefs. I have no idea what I would do or if I would do anything. But let's say that I was supposed to do something um, to step into the abusive situation. I would most definitely do it. And it may very well involve being physical. Um, does that mean that that the oneself has a violent aspect? No. Sometimes, because there are bodies, uh, uh, you need to start. I mean, if someone is is hitting a child with a stick, and I'm there, the chances are I'm supposed to be there to stop that. Now, when it's done, when it's finished, when everything is finished, whatever the scenario is, long or short. I would wipe my hands of it. I would let it go, totally. You see, I wouldn't join a a, a mission uh, to march on on uh, uh, the streets and and uh, and go out against uh, this uh, issue or that issue. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. That is part of the destiny of many people to be what's called activists. At some point in time, they will all drop that. But that's part of what's necessary to take them from wherever they are in the dream to another part of the dream. So uh, the key is when you are involved in anything and you're free is you let it go. You do not become, quote unquote, part of conditioning attached to the issue, no matter what it was. See, that's freedom. Freedom's there and then it's gone. There and then it's gone. It doesn't allow the dream to control it. Elena, you had a question? Okay, Miss 65. Me? Oh yeah, you. Oh. <laughs> some, you you I, raised I, your I hand. Some, maybe it's uh, m m no no, it's maybe mistaken. Sorry. Okay, then Miss Sixty Five, you can continue. <laughs> yes, thank you. That uh, thank you for that answer, John. It, it made you human no. still. <laughs> um, well, it seems that way. I assure you, I'm not. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it say it said it sounds that way. Yeah, uh, my thing is. This is my adult daughter, and she she works in finance, and she works so many hours, and are somehow forced to to work many hours, and then they say, "Oh, you go to this country next week," mm -hmm. and and she's tired. And I actually is very um, uh, worried about something going to happen to her because she's driving cars between uh, real estate and all that. So I I get so upset about it so i got this dream in the morning uh somehow contacting oprah and i have this um i get signs of things to do i haven't i began to write to to oprah but i haven't uh, finished it but the, the the condition still remains but it's not my condition it's my daughter's of course she can uh, seek another job and all that but that doesn't leave the circumstances that so many young people and other people in that industry is living by. It it could be okay. We are here to live our own lives, but we are also living here together to change lives 
uh, together as well. So, uh, like you, it made me realize you, you actually would protect your child. Uh, that so, but not leaving it, it, it still worries me. So, I am in this uh, dilemma, but not a dilemma like that. I, I just want to be activated to be pulled to it again because I don't force myself anymore because I want to be attracted to something and then believe in the in the following uh, that it's the momentum that is creating of it so um, I just wanted to thank you for being human that we actually have these instincts and I don't want yeah, to be yeah, an activist. Let, let, I don't let want me, to be let, an activist either let, let me in, mm -hmm. let me interrupt I am not human I'm <laughs> I am in a physical body yeah i i am capital letters i am the one self in a physical body acting out as as a human but i am not human in the sense that people say that makes you human no i would not have a a predilection um a, a pre-cognitive idea of how i would respond to a given situation because mm -hmm. the sense of right and wrong um that most people have no longer exists i would respond according to how the one self i am uh guides in that moment and it may not appear to be what the false self of let's say a group of people standing around thinks should happen it doesn't it doesn't respond according to, to a curriculum of what's right or wrong and let's just talk about your daughter she is precisely where she's supposed to be until the moment that she leaves it because the conditioning brought her there and it's always not about being you know we're here to be ourselves or that we're here to change anyone or to fix the world these things are absolutely illusions you're here for one reason only and that is to wake up to who you are to become aware of the one self that you are that's the only reason that you're here and if your daughter is in a job that that has this or that situation that makes her look like a uh, poor me or a victim or she's in danger or her health is being threatened all of those aspects of what's going on in her life are part of her conditioning meant to bring her attention to who she is not they're triggers and she'll be there until she gets it. And if she moved to some other job that seemed more utopian, exactly the same conditions would manifest in a different way because that's the condition that's ready to come up. You cannot avoid this. You cannot create the ideal situation. You cannot dance at two weddings. You're not here to make your 3D dream life more cozy. When you get onto the pathless path to freedom, it's very often lonely and it's very often extremely fiery. And it's very often extremely difficult because you are dissolving that which you are not. It's not meant to be a sit around the fire singing kumbaya and, and hugging each other, all of which can happen and is wonderful, but that's not what spirituality is about. You're here for one reason, and that is to become aware of who you really are everything else is an illusion none of it's real none of it's true and it's not important wow what a what a powerful way of stating these things thank you john <laughs> and now and now it's getting to the time to wrap up do you have anything particular you would like to share before we wrap it up? Not at all. Does anyone have a last question? Then raise your hand, otherwise I will wrap it up with John. Okay, then I'd like to ask you if people want to reach you, where would they reach you? What's the best Well, of course way? I'm on Facebook. Um, yeah. And um, uh, I don't think they have to be a friend in order to to write to me, but um, uh, an email um, that they could use is globalpeaceweb, one word, at gmail.com, globalpeaceweb at gmail.com. 
um, should be easy to spell. Uh, I am not a counselor. Um, I don't uh, counsel. I'm not a teacher. I don't charge money for anything, although I do have books. And uh, because the publisher charges for books, uh, you could say there's a charge for that. My website is johnmackintosh.info. I N F O John Macintosh. I think everyone has the spelling of my name, John Macintosh dot info, uh, where you'll find my 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 books and my blog and um, a few other things. Um, uh, I I don't speak to people very often because most people haven't made the no matter what choice to be free. If someone has made the no matter what choice to be free, I will know it. And for them, uh, time is not an issue, but there's very, very few so far. Wonderful. Then I will put your homepage in the episode description. You just have to send it to me when, um, again. Sure, sure. So thank you for being here, John. It was a, pleasure. a real pleasure. It was wonderful. Um, we got to know the the way you see things in in ways that are new to us, right? And also very very deep teachings that that you're taking from that have been there a long time, right? So you're reminding us of of who we are, right? I uh, call it C C spot run. It's like reading a ki kindergarten book. C spot run, not complicated. Yeah, and I would like to ask all of you to review the podcast wherever you're listening to it when you do, and you are welcome, and spread the word so other people find it or come to the live events of podcast recordings. And yeah, till next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye for now.